Well, good morning, friends. My name is James Howell. I'm one of the pastors here at Myers Spark United Methodist Church. Thank you so, so much for joining us for worship. We are together in God's house. I, I sure miss you being right in front of me. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Uh, we're still a family in uh, God's good grace. I, I want to ask you today to, to reach out. You reach out to me if you want. I'd love to hear from you, get a photo of you, tell me how you're doing, james at mpumc.org. But more importantly, reach out to somebody that you know from your church family, you know, one of your pew neighbors, somebody you know from a class, an activity, somebody you know just goes to our church and say, hey, how you doing? Just check in. Stay, we stay connected uh, with each other. But it's good to be together for this worship service uh, this morning. Good morning, church family. It is good to be with you. Um, I, too, am missing your voices and your faces in the hallways and in our pews, but we know that we're gathered together in this space with God uniting us. The Old Testament reading is Genesis chapter 25, beginning with the 19th verse. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went, to the, she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, they, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved, e loved Esau because he was fond of the game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob, then gave Jacob Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of God for the people of God. I love the story of these unidentical twins. It reminds me of this uh, story the great spiritual writer Henry Nowen used to tell about fraternal twins in their mother's womb, uh, a boy and a girl. And uh, the girl spoke to her brother one day and said, um, I've been thinking about this. I, I believe in that there's life after birth. And he said, what do you mean life after birth? This is all there is. This is a cozy, warm place. We just cling to the cord that feeds us. She said, yeah, I just, I believe there's another place, a place where there's light and freedom of movement. And he said, oh, pshaw, it's ridiculous. Hurt her feelings, but there was nobody else to talk to. So after a while, she said, uh, there's something else, I believe, and you may not like it. He said, what? She said, um, I believe there's a mother. He said, a mother? I, you never seen a mother? What, what put an idea like that in your head that there's a mother? You know, just, just be content where we are. This is, a, this is a warm, comfortable place. That hurt her feelings, so she didn't say anything to her brother for a very, very long time. But finally, she just couldn't keep her thoughts to herself any longer. And she said, do you, do you ever notice those squeezes once in a while? He said, yeah. He said, they're really uh, painful. She said, I believe those squeezes are getting us ready for a better place. I believe those squeezes are getting us ready for life after birth when we will see our mother face to face. He was just tired of her imagining. I love that story. Uh, twins. I uh, took the liberty this week to uh, reach out to some twins in our church and to some parents of twins. And uh, let's hear what they have to say about being twins. From the beginning, the bond between our five-year-old twins has been more than brotherhood, as it is truly their living, breathing existence. It's been amazing to watch them grow into two very different people who, you know, just happen to look a lot alike. He, um, he, um, he's 
he plays with me and I like him so much and, and I help him the, and I help him guys, with like, it's my turn. You won't spoil this video. It's okay. And then we have um our friendships together and um we'll never um break our friendship. So my dad and Lisa Howell's dad are twins, turning 90 later this month. And they still jostle a bit like they did when they were kids, but they have just always had and still have an incredible amount of love for each other. My twin sister and I have a lot in common, including a lot of our interests and shared friends, but we do have some differences in personality, including my sister is very argumentative, whereas I avoid conflict at all costs. And while that doesn't necessarily make me the good twin, I think it should be taken into consideration. I'm an identical twin. I have a brother, John, who is five minutes younger. He is the bossy twin, but I am the better looking twin and we will always be there for each other. Sure, our twins get into it, but they have such a quick forgiveness for each other. They let things slide. People always try to compare us. But we're very different. Our twins are not identical, and although they share many of the same interests and values, they're very different in many ways. They both enjoy being their own individual selves, but have always had this special bond that we non-twins can only really stand in awe and wonder how wonderful that must be. We have twins, a boy and a girl, rising 10th graders. And as I look back on them growing up so far, I'm struck by their bond, the way they communicate with each other, and probably most notably, the way they quickly resolve their differences and just move on. We were blessed with fraternal twins, a boy and a girl. They were obviously different, but not just the fact that they were a boy and a girl. Early on, their character traits revealed that they were different in very many ways. As their personalities uh, evolved, that remained true with one exception, and that is that they both had and still have a great sense of humor. You know, the whole question of uh, identical, unidentical twins, it, it, it's really a myth, right? Even identical twins, uh, my father-in-law is one, uh, they're not identical. Genetically, there are differences even uh, between identical twins. And, and in fact, genetic differences among people, period, aren't so great. A, a short white guy doesn't differ genetically from a tall black guy much more than fraternal twins differ from one another. I love even the fact that my DNA is 99% is shared with the chimpanzees. This makes some people crazy, but I think it's just absolutely delightful. I want to be more chimp-like <laughs> if I can be. Uh, these unidentical twins in the story in Genesis and Esau. Esau, he's the uh, hairy outdoorsman. He is his father's son, rugged, tough guy, hairy, red-haired. Uh, Jacob, his brother, he, he's, he's a smooth man. He, he's an indoor guy. He's a mama's boy. They could not be more different, even though they are twins coming out of their mother's womb. I try to think of analogies today. You know, this might be, you know, like the NRA guy versus, you know, a pacifist or, oh, I don't know, somebody who says Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and another one who says, we got to save our statues. Could be somebody who says Donald Trump is the way, the truth, and the life. But somebody else who says, I just wish it were Bernie instead of Biden. All these kind of people. You know, in the United Methodist Church, we've divided over people who say traditional marriage is sacred. And those who say, well, we got to welcome everybody. And what, what happens when we have these divisions? Is, it's so interesting. We wind up loathing the people that are closest to us. I've seen these family outbreaks on Facebook. People are debating politics or ideology or whatever. They're akin to one another, and they're just blasting one another, and they unfriend each other, and it, uh, it's the people that we're closest to that we wind up loathing the most. What is that about? What is God uh, asking of us uh, during these times? You know, we just passed July 4th. Uh, when I was a kid, he, we, my sister and I would spend every summer with our grandparents up in Oakboro. It's a little town 
Uh, up in uh, Stanley County, a great little town. They had a big July 4th carnival parade. It was great fun. And I remember after my grandfather retired, he was a postal uh, rural mail carrier. After he retired, he would do this thing. He, he'd, uh, we'd eat breakfast and do a few chores. And then he'd take my hand and he'd walk me down the street a couple of blocks to Mr. Teeter's store. And in Mr. Teeter's store, he and some other men would sit on these wooden chairs in a circle and uh, Papa Howell would put a, a can there because he'd be chewing tobacco and he'd spit uh, like perilously close to my foot. Oh, my goodness. And uh, what Papa Howell and his friends would do every day is they, they'd argue all day long. They'd argue over whether it was better to be Democrat or Republican. They'd argue whether it was better to be Methodist or Baptist. I don't know why that was an argument. Anyway, they would argue all day long and listen to each other and mount their cases. And at the end of the day, Papa Howell would go home and he'd come back the next day and they'd do, do it all over again. It was a beautiful thing. We've forgotten how to be people like this. The virtue of a democracy ought to be that we can disagree without killing each other. But nowadays, run over people, they just want to kill each other. What do we do? And I say this thing to you sometimes, it's not a scold. Don't receive it that way. I say if you only hang around with people that are like you, you become arrogant and ignorant. I'm not fussing at anybody. It's just my job to call all of us to be our fullest self. If you're only around people who think like you, it's, it's like Narcissus gazing into the pool. You just see yourself as an echo chamber that you live in. You become really narrow. You miss out on so much of the richness of life. God calls us to something far broader than that, right? God calls us to fullness of life, to know all of God's creatures, God calls us to test our ideas against others who disagree with us, to be humble, to be open, to think, I don't already know everything yet. It's like a spiritual death trap, isn't it? I've got everything figured out. No, you don't. <laughs> Jesus was a great questioner everywhere. He was asking questions. What about this? What about that? Socrates, maybe the wisest man who ever lived, always was asking questions. Emily Dickinson said, the unknown is the mind's greatest gift, and for it, no one thinks to thank God. I'm excited about the things that I don't know yet. <laughs> That's why God made us with curiosity. That's why God made our brains where they, they don't really fill up at age 13 or 43 or 73. There's a lot more room in there, a lot more room in the soul. I mean, I just wonder... If God hasn't placed us in a time of testing, I wouldn't say God caused the pandemic and God certainly didn't kill George Floyd, but we find ourselves, it's, it's like twin tests right now, right? <laughs> is, is, what are we going to make of this pandemic season? You know, what are we going to make of this racial tension season? Hmm? It's a test. God's waiting to see what kind of people are you going to be? Who are you going to become during such a time. It's uh, tempting as I think about the story in Genesis, these very unidentical twins to think, this is probably right, is that they're actually twins inside me and you, right? There are a couple people in there. And there's maybe the person that you, you trot out when you're in public that looks nice and is cheerful and all that, but there's some darker person inside you, or you, can you reconcile with that very different twin of you that sends, I don't love uh, Robert Bly years ago wrote this book called Iron John. And it begins with, uh, there's a hunter and uh, he comes up to a castle and uh, the king uh, opens the gate and the hunter says, is there anything dangerous to do around here? And the king says, well, there is the forest over there, but no one ever returns. And the hunter says, that sounds like the kind of thing that I like. So the hunter plunged into the forest with his dog on a leash and they came into a clearing and there was a pond and this big hairy arm reached up, grabbed the dog, and pulled it under the water. And the hunter said, well, this must be the place. He went back to the castle and said, do you have a bucket? And the king gave him a bucket. And the hunter went to the pond, and he started just scooping the water out, scooping the water out, until finally, well, it was the dog, but also there was the hairy arm. It was a great big guy covered with red hair, Iron John, hmm? 
And Robert Blass says, that's a parable for how do we dig inside ourselves? How do we learn, what do I not know about myself? What in me is broken? What in me is flawed that I don't even, I don't even know it yet? What is the mess that is in me? That might be God's calling during this pandemic season. And it's actually the only way to begin to move toward reconciliation with others. You know, Jacob, he has to go on a long life journey, figuring himself out, his own brokenness, wrestles with God through the middle of the night, comes out of that wounded. He's on the run from everybody. Esau goes off and has massive difficulties. They have a lot of inner struggles that they got to work through. But finally, in the end, they come together. And it's not just that they have to struggle with them. They have to sacrifice a lot. Jacob loses a lot. Esau loses a lot. And after they've lost a lot, then they're ready in the end to throw their arms around each other and love each other. We forget this. People say, we need unity. I realized this a few years back in the United Methodist Church. We say, both sides were saying, we want unity. That meant, what you come over to my side, we'll have unity. I'm not giving anything up. And in our country now, people say, oh, we need to come together as a nation, but I'm not giving up my pet ideology. We're not going to come together until we give up something that's precious. We're not going to be one until we sacrifice something that we think is just not sacrificable, but otherwise we just never come together. That's how it is in all relationships, isn't it? And then the sacrifice becomes not a loss, but something beautiful that we offer to God and to the other person for the sake of love, for the sake of reconciliation. I was thinking about this uh, race, race going on in our country. I thumbed back through a book I read years ago about Stud Strickle. Stud, Stud Strickle interviewed people all over the country, white people, black people. What, what's your thinking about race? What's your experience? It's a, it's a really rich book. And to me, the best thing in that, and it's a big, long book, the best thing in the book is right toward the end. He interviews a 31-year-old African-American whose name is Lloyd King. And what Lloyd King said to Stud Strickle just annihilated me, and I've never forgotten it. And it might surprise you, but it might be our hope. Here, here, here's, here's what he said. He said, the real tragedy between blacks and whites isn't that we hate each other. Hatred is a shallow force that only cuts so deep. The real tragedy is that we actually love each other. The tragedy lies in the complex folds of this love which gets twisted into intolerance. We're like a married couple that got started on the wrong foot. Tension builds and builds, making us want a divorce before I go crazy and kill the other one. Yet at the heart of things, we love each other. Friends, what if God is asking us to realize that in God's good dispensation, we do love each other. Not just that God asks us to love each other, but maybe we already do, and that's why it's actually so hard to get along. What if we went through our days imagining, I, I do love this other person, my un, unidentical twin who's making me crazy. I actually love this person. That's part of why he's making me crazy. It's part of why she drives me to distraction. It's a time of testing God wants us Christians not to be right, not to judge, not to... That's not of God. It's of God when we love. And, and love is so interesting. Thinking again of you know, unidentical brothers, I was drawing, in closing. I was drawn toward uh, the great scene in uh, the book and then the movie, A River Runs Through It. Uh, Reverend McQuain has two sons, and they couldn't be more different. One son's upright. He always does the right thing. And then the younger son, he, it's like the prodigal son, Jesus' story. The younger son you know, lives you know, just a crazy life, and he winds up dead, young. So the older brother, he's attending to his father, who's a, who's a pastor. And in the last sermon that his father ever preached, he said this, each one of us here today will at one time in our lives look upon a loved one who is in need and ask the same question. We are willing to help, Lord, but what if anything is needed? 
For it is true that we can seldom help those closest to us. Either we don't know what part of ourselves to give, or more often than not, the part we have to give is not wanted. And so it is those we live with and should know who elude us. But we can still love them. We can love completely without complete understanding. Sometimes we see people who think differently politically or they're of a different, like that construct, race, <laughs> whatever that is. It's not really a genetic reality, is it? We look at people that are different and we... We don't, we don't get it. And we think, what part of me do I have to offer to figure? We, uh, we don't know. We're just at a loss. And maybe that's as it should be. We're just at a loss. We sigh. We listen. We wonder. We just don't know. But that's okay. Because as Reverend McLean said, we may not understand, but we can love. We can love completely. We can love perfectly without understanding. Jacob and Esau saw, I'm sure, at the end of their days, just looked at each other and thought, he's the smooth guy, he's the hairy guy. He, what? They just had to be puzzled by one another. But at the end of the day, they figured out how to love. They were kin, they were twins, they were brothers, they were siblings. Isaac and Rebecca's children God's children, our brothers. Thanks be to God. Church family, let us go before God and join our voices with the prayer of confession that you will find on your screen. Almighty and gracious God, before you all hearts are open, all our minds are fully known, we are a broken people, deep inside our souls and in our relationships with others. We are a fractured society, and we all suffer as a result. Our sins of omission, of judging others, of thinking we've got it all figured out, and our failures of compassion. As we confess, we ask for your healing we know we are one in you. We are brothers and sisters. We actually do love one another. Awaken this deep truth in all of us so we might live fully as your people and discover peace in our hearts so reconciliation with others might dawn. Let us continue in a time of prayer. God of all peoples, generations, genders, nationalities, we celebrate you. We are in awe of how we bow before you this morning, spread across this city, state, country, and world, and that we know we worship together. We praise you, we grieve with you, and we are forgiven by you, and God, we give glory to you that we as siblings near and far are all together in praise this morning. So we rejoice and we are glad in this truth. God of compassion, in our rejoicing, we also come with heavy grief-stricken hearts. We mourn the deaths of those who have faced the battle of COVID. We also grieve and lift to you the family of Sally Saz, a young daughter, a sister, a friend, and a community difference maker. God, be with the family now in their season of pain and grief and mourning. God, we also lift to you the family of Linda Castleberry. We rejoice in her uniting with the heavenly host and we also hold her friends and family in prayer as they grieve her loss. Compassionate God, surround all those who are struggling with grief this morning, those who are struggling with pains, sicknesses, and uncertainties in this anxious season of life. God of mercy, 
Oh, how we need your merciful breath to fill our lungs right now. Breathe your breath of mercy and conviction into our world as we repent of the ways we have neglected our siblings. God, we do know better, yet we continue to harm one another. Forgive us, we pray. We have become inebriated with idols of the world, and due to such we have foregone the care of our siblings, your beloved children. So God, trouble our hearts and spirits until all children separated from families are reunited as one. Strengthen our voices to speak against systemic racism and discrimination. Bother our souls into action until every soul is valued, respected, loved, and given equitable life. Conflict our complacency when we excuse ourselves from the work that has to be done so that we all one day might be reconciled together on earth as it is in heaven. For we know, Mother God, that we are yours, and so too are our siblings, and in that truth we know we are better together and belong together for the sake of bringing love, a relentless life-giving love, into this world. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, who freely gave of himself so that we might have eternal life together. Amen.